Recording by Asterix. Woodhouse in the Strand. Short story collection by Pelham Grenville Woodhouse. Chapter 19. The Magic Plus Fours. After all, said the young man, golf's only a game. He spoke bitterly, and with the air of one who has been following a train of thought. He had come into the smoking-room of the clubhouse in low spirits at the dusky close of a November evening, and for some minutes had been sitting, silent and moody, staring at the log fire. "'Merely a pastime,' said the young man. The oldest member, nodding in his armchair, stiffened with horror, and glanced quickly over his shoulder to make sure that none of the waiters had heard these terrible words. "'Can this be George William Pennefather speaking?' he said reproachfully. "'My boy, you are not yourself.' The young man flushed a little beneath his tan, for he had had a good upbringing and was not bad at heart. "'Perhaps I ought not to have gone quite so far as that,' he admitted. "'I was only thinking that a fellow's got no right just because he happens to have come on a bit in his form lately to treat a fellow as if a fellow was a leper or something the oldest member's face cleared and he breathed a relieved sigh ah i see he said you spoke hastily and in a sudden fit of pique because something upset you out on the links to-day tell me all let me see you were playing with nathaniel frisbee this afternoon were you not I gather that he beat you. Yes, he did, giving me a third, but it isn't being beaten that I mind. What I object to is having the blighter behave as if he were a sort of champion, condescending to a mere mortal. Dash it, it seemed to bore him playing with me. Every time I sliced off the tea, he looked at me as if I were a painful ordeal. Twice, when I was having a bit of trouble in the bushes, I caught him yawning and after we had finished he started talking about what a good game croquet was and he wondered more people didn't take it up and it's only a month or so ago that i could play the man level the oldest member shook his snowy head sadly there is nothing to be done about it he said we can only hope that the poison will in time work its way out of the man's system sudden success at golf is like the sudden acquisition of wealth it is apt to unsettle and deteriorate the character and as it comes almost miraculously so only a miracle can effect a cure the best advice i can give you is to refrain from playing with nathaniel frisbee till you can keep your tea shots straight oh but don't run away with the idea that i wasn't pretty good off the tea this afternoon said the young man i should like to describe to you the shot i did on the meanwhile proceeded the oldest member i will relate to you a little story which bears on what i have been saying from the moment i addressed the ball it is the story of two loving hearts temporarily estranged owing to the sudden and unforeseen proficiency of one of the couple i waggled quickly and strongly like duncan then swinging smoothly back rather in the varden manner but i see said the oldest member that you are all impatience for me to begin i will do so without further preamble to the philosophical student of golf like myself said the oldest member perhaps the most outstanding virtue of this noble pursuit is the fact that it is a medicine for the soul its great service to humanity is that it teaches human beings that whatever petty triumphs they may have achieved in other walks of life they are after all merely human it acts as a corrective against sinful pride i attribute the insane arrogance of the later roman emperors almost entirely to the fact that never having played golf they never knew that strange chastening humility which is engendered by a topped chip shot if cleopatra had been outed in the first round of the lady singles we should have heard a lot less of her proud imperiousness and coming down to modern times it was undoubtedly his rotten golf that kept wallace chesney the nice unspoiled fellow that he was 
for in every other respect he had everything in the world calculated to make a man conceited and arrogant he was the best-looking man for miles around his health was perfect and in addition to this he was rich danced rode played bridge and polo with equal skill and was engaged to be married to charlotte dix and when you saw charlotte dix you realized that being engaged to her would by itself have been quite enough luck for any one man but wallace as i say despite all his advantages was a thoroughly nice modest young fellow and i attribute this to the fact that while one of the keenest golfers in the club he was also one of the worst players indeed charlotte dix used to say to me in his presence that she could not understand why people paid money to go to the circus when by merely walking over the brow of a hill they could watch wallace chesney trying to get out of the bunker by the eleventh green and wallace took the jibe with perfect good humour for there was a delightful camaraderie between them which robbed it of any sting often at lunch in the clubhouse i used to hear him and charlotte planning the handicapping details of a proposed match between wallace and a non-existent cripple whom charlotte claimed to have discovered in the village it being agreed finally that he should accept seven bisques from the cripple but that if the latter ever recovered the use of his arms wallace should get a stroke a hole in short a thoroughly happy and united young couple two hearts if i may coin an expression that beat as one i would not have you misjudge wallace chesney i may have given you the impression that his attitude towards golf was light and frivolous but such was not the case as i have said he was one of the keenest members of the club love made him receive the joshing of his fiancée in the kindly spirit in which it was meant but at heart he was as earnest as you could wish he practised early and late he bought golf books and the mere sight of a patent club of any description acted on him like catnip on a cat i remember remonstrating with him on the occasion of his purchasing a wooden-faced driving mashie which weighed about two pounds and was taking it for all in all as foul an instrument as ever came out of the workshop of a club-maker who had been dropped on the head by his nurse when a baby i know i know he said when i had finished indicating some of the weapon's more obvious defects but the point is i believe in it it gives me confidence i don't believe you could slice with a thing like that if you tried confidence that was what wallace chesney lacked and that as he saw it was the prime grand secret of golf like an alchemist on the track of the philosopher's stone he was for ever seeking for something which would really give him confidence i recollect that he even tried repeating to himself fifty times every morning the words every day in every way i grow better and better this however proved such a black lie that he gave it up the fact is the man was a visionary and it is to auto-hypnosis of some kind that i attribute the extraordinary change that came over him at the beginning of his third season you may have noticed in your perambulations about the city a shop bearing above its door and upon its windows the legend cohen brothers second-hand clothiers a statement which is borne out by endless vistas seen through the door of every variety of what is technically known as gents wear but the brothers cohen though their main stock in trade is garments which have been rejected by their owners for one reason or another do not confine their dealings to gents wear the place is a museum of derelict goods of every description you can get a second-hand revolver there or a second-hand sword or a second-hand umbrella you can do a cheap deal in field glasses trunks dog collars canes photograph frames attache cases and bowls for goldfish and on the bright spring morning when wallace chesney happened to pass by there was exhibited in the window a putter of such pre-eminently lunatic design that he stopped dead as if he had run into an invisible wall and then panting like an overwrought fish charged him through the door 
the shop was full of the cohen family sombre eyed smileless men with purposeful expressions and two of these instantly descending upon wallace chesney like leopards began in swift silence to thrust him into a suit of yellow tweed having worked the coat over his shoulders with a shoe-horn they stood back to watch the effect a beautiful fit announced isidore cohen a little snug under the arms said his brother irving but that'll give the warmth of the body will make it give said isidore or maybe you'll lose weight in the summer said irving wallace when he had struggled out of the coat and was able to breathe said that he had come in to buy a putter isidore thereupon sold him the putter a dog collar and a set of studs and irving sold him a fireman's helmet and he was about to leave when their elder brother lou who had just finished fitting out another customer who had come in to buy a cap with two pairs of trousers and a miniature aquarium for keeping newts in saw that business was in progress and strolled up his fathomless eye rested on wallace who was toying feebly with the putter you play golf asked lou then look a here he dived into an alleyway of dead clothing dug for a moment and emerged with something at the sight of which wallace chesney hardened golfer that he was blenched and threw up an arm defensively no no he cried the object which lou cohen was waving insinuatingly before his eyes was a pair of those golfing breeches which are technically known as plus fours a player of two years standing wallace chesney was not unfamiliar with plus fours all the club cracks wore them but he had never seen plus fours like these what might be termed the main motif of the fabric was a curious vivid pink and with this to work on the architect had let his imagination run free and had produced so much variety in the way of chessboard squares of white yellow violet and green that the eye swam as it looked upon them these were made to measure for sandy mchoots the open champion said lou stroking the left leg lovingly but he sent em back for some reason or other perhaps they frightened the children said wallace recollecting having heard that mchoots was a married man they'll fit you nice said lou sure they'll fit him nice said isidore warmly why just take a look at yourself in the glass said irving and see if they don't fit you nice and as one who wakes from a trance wallace discovered that his lower limbs were now encased in the prismatic garment at what point in the proceedings the brethren had slipped them on him he could not have said but he was undeniably in wallace looked in the glass for a moment as he eyed his reflection sheer horror gripped him then suddenly as he gazed he became aware that his first feelings were changing the initial shock over he was becoming calmer he waggled his right leg with a certain sang froid there is a certain passage in the works of the poet pope with which you may be familiar it runs as follows vice is a monster of so frightful mien as to be hated needs but to be seen yet so too oft familiar with her face we first endure then pity then embrace even so was it with wallace chesney and these plus fours at first he had recoiled from them as any decent-minded man would have done then after a while almost abruptly he found himself in the grip of a new emotion after an unsuccessful attempt to analyze this he suddenly got it amazing as it may seem it was pleasure that he felt he caught his eye in the mirror and it was smirking now that the things were actually on by hutchinson they didn't look half bad by braid they didn't there was a sort of something about them take away that expanse of bare leg with its unsightly sock suspender and substitute a woolly stocking and you would have the lower section of a golfer for the first time in his life he thought he looked like a man who could play golf there came to him an odd sensation of masterfulness he was still holding the putter and now he swung it up above his shoulder 
a fine swing all lissomeness and supple grace quite different from any swing he had ever done before wallace chesney gasped he knew that at last he had discovered that prime grand secret of golf for which he had searched so long it was the costume that did it all he had to do was wear plus fours he had always hitherto played in grey flannel trousers naturally he had not been able to do himself justice golf required an easy dash and how could you be easily dashing in concertina shaped trousers with a patch on the knee he saw now what he had never seen before that it was not because they were crack players that crack players wore plus fours it was because they wore plus fours that they were crack players and these plus fours had been the property of an open champion wallace chesney's bosom swelled and he was filled as by some strange gas with joy with excitement with confidence yes for the first time in in his golfing life he felt really confident true the things might have been a shade less gaudy they might perhaps have hit the eye with a slightly less violent punch but what of that true again he could scarcely hope to avoid the censure of his clubmates when he appeared like this on the links but what of that his clubmates must set their teeth and learn to bear these plus fours like men that was what wallace chesney thought about it if they did not like his plus fours let them go and play golf somewhere else how much he muttered thickly and the brothers cohen clustered grimly round with notebooks and pencils in predicting a stormy reception for his new apparel wallace chesney had not been unduly pessimistic the moment he entered the clubhouse disaffection reared its ugly head friends of years standing called loudly for the committee and there was a small and vehement party of the left wing headed by raymond gandall who was an artist by profession and consequently had a sensitive eye which advocated the tearing off and public burial of the obnoxious garment but prepared as he had been for some such demonstration on the part of the coarser minded wallace had hoped for better things when he should meet charlotte dix the girl who loved him charlotte he had supposed would understand and sympathize instead of which she uttered a piercing cry and staggered to a bench whence a moment later she delivered her ultimatum quick she said before i have to look again what do you mean pop straight back into the changing room while i've got my eyes shut and remove the fancy dress what's wrong with them darling said charlotte i think it's sweet and patriotic of you to be proud of your cycling club colours or whatever they are but you mustn't wear them on the links it will unsettle the caddies they are a trifle on the bright side admitted wallace but it helps my game wearing them i was trying a few practice shots just now and i couldn't go wrong slam the ball on the meat every time they inspire me if you know what i mean come on let's be starting charlotte opened her eyes incredulously you can't seriously mean that you're really going to play in those it's against the rules there must be a rule somewhere in the book against coming out looking like a sunset won't you go and burn them for my sake but i tell you they give me confidence i sort of squint down at them when i'm addressing the ball and i feel like a pro then the only thing to do is for me to play you for them come on wally be a sportsman i'll give you a half and play you for the whole outfit the breeches the red jacket the little cap and the belt with the snake's head buckle i'm sure all those things must have gone with the breeches is it a bargain strolling on the clubhouse terrace some two hours later raymond gandall encountered charlotte and wallace coming up from the eighteenth green just the girl i wanted to see said raymond miss dix i represent a select committee of my fellow members and i have come to ask you on their behalf to use the influence of a good woman to induce wally to destroy those plus fours of his which we all consider nothing short of bolshevik propaganda and a menace to the public weal may i rely on you 
you may not retorted charlotte they are the poor boy's mascot you've no idea how they have improved his game he has just beaten me hollow i am going to try to learn to bear them so you must really you've no notion how he has come on my cripple won't be able to give him more than a couple of bisques if he keeps up this form it's something about the things said wallace they give me confidence they give me a pain in the neck said raymond gandall to the thinking man nothing is more remarkable in this life than the way in which humanity adjusts itself to conditions which at their outset might well have appeared intolerable some great cataclysm occurs some storm or earthquake shaking the community to its foundations and after the first pardonable consternation one finds the sufferers resuming their ordinary pursuits as if nothing had happened there have been few more striking examples of this adaptability than the behaviour of the members of our golf club under the impact of wallace chesney's plus fours for the first few days it is not too much to say that they were stunned nervous players sent their caddies on in front of them at blind holes so that they might be warned in time of wallace's presence ahead and not have him happening to them all of a sudden and even the pro was not unaffected brought up in scotland in an atmosphere of tartan kilts he nevertheless winced and a startled hoots was forced from his lips when wallace chesney suddenly appeared in the valley as he was about to drive from the fifth tee but in about a week conditions were back to normalcy within ten days the plus fours became a familiar feature of the landscape and were accepted as such without comment they were pointed out to strangers together with the waterfall the lover's leap and the view from the eighth green as things you ought not to miss when visiting the course but apart from that one might almost say they were ignored and meanwhile wallace chesney continued day by day to make the most extraordinary progress in his play as i said before and i think you will agree with me when i have told you what happened subsequently it was probably a case of auto-hypnosis there is no other sphere in which a belief in oneself has such immediate effects as it has in golf and wallace having acquired self-confidence went on from strength to strength in under a week he had ploughed his way through the unfortunate incidents of which class peter willard was the best example and was challenging the fellows who kept three shots in five somewhere on the fairway a month later he was holding his own with ten handicapped men and by the middle of the summer he was so far advanced that his name occasionally cropped up in speculative talks on the subject of the july medal one might have been excused for supposing that as far as wallace chesney was concerned all was for the best in the best of all possible worlds and yet the first inkling i received that anything was wrong came through a chance meeting with raymond gandall who happened to pass my gate on his way back from the links just as i drove up in my taxi for i had been away from home for many weeks on a protracted business tour i welcomed gandall's advent and invited him in to smoke a pipe and put me abreast of local gossip he came readily enough and seemed indeed to have something on his mind and to be glad of the opportunity of revealing it to a sympathetic auditor and how i asked him when we were comfortably settled did your game this afternoon come out oh he beat me said gandall and it seemed to me that there was a note of bitterness in his voice then he whoever he was must have been an extremely competent performer i replied courteously for gandall was one of the finest players in the club unless of course you were giving him some impossible handicap no we played level indeed who was your opponent chesney wallace chesney and he beat you playing level this is the most amazing thing i have ever heard he's improved out of all knowledge he must have done do you think he would ever beat you again no because he won't have the chance you surely do not mean that you will not play him because you are afraid of being beaten it isn't being beaten i mind 
and if i omit to report the remainder of his speech it is not merely because it contained expressions with which i am reluctant to sully my lips but because omitting these expletives what he said was almost word for word what you were saying to me just now about nathaniel's frisbee it was it seemed wallace chesney's manner his arrogance his attitude of belonging to some superior order of being that had so wounded raymond gandall wallace chesney had it appeared criticised gandall's mashy play in no friendly spirit had hung up the game on the fourteenth tee in order to show him how to place his feet and on the way back to the clubhouse had said that the beauty of golf was that the best player could enjoy a round even with a dud because though there might be no interest in the match he could always amuse himself by playing for his medal score i was profoundly shaken wallace chesney i exclaimed was it really wallace chesney who behaved in the manner you describe unless he's got a twin brother of the same name it was wallace chesney a victim to swelled head i can hardly credit it well you needn't take my word for it unless you want to ask anybody it isn't often he can get anyone to play with him now you horrify me raymond gandall smoked a while in brooding silence you've heard about his engagement he said at length i have heard nothing nothing what about his engagement charlotte dix has broken it off no yes couldn't stand him any longer i got rid of gandal as soon as i could i made my way as quickly as possible to the house where charlotte lived with her aunt i was determined to sift this matter to the bottom and to do all that lay in my power to heal the breach between two young people for whom i had a great affection i have just heard the news i said when the aunt had retired to some secret lair as aunts do and charlotte and i were alone what news said charlotte dully i thought she looked pale and ill and she had certainly grown thinner this dreadful news about your engagement to wallace chesney tell me why did you do this thing is there no hope of a reconciliation not unless wally becomes his old self again but i had always regarded you two as ideally suited to one another wally has changed completely in the last few weeks haven't you heard only sketchily from raymond gandall i refuse said charlotte proudly all the woman in her leaping to her eyes to marry a man who treats me as if i were a cronin at the present rate of exchange merely because i slice an occasional tea-shot the afternoon i broke off the engagement her voice shook and i could see her indifference was but a mask the afternoon i broke off the eng engagement he told me i ought to use an iron off the tea instead of a d -d driver and the stricken girl burst into an uncontrollable fit of sobbing and realizing that if matters had gone so far as that there was little i could do i pressed her hand silently and left her but though it seemed hopeless i decided to persevere i turned my steps towards wallace chesney's bungalow resolved to make one appeal to the man's better feelings he was in his sitting-room when i arrived polishing a putter and it seemed significant to me even in that tense moment that the putter was quite an ordinary one such as any capable player might use in the brave old happy days of his dudhood the only putters you ever found in the society of wallace chesney were patent self-adjusting things that looked like croquet mallets that had taken the wrong turning in childhood well wallace my boy i said hello said wallace chesney so you're back we fell into conversation and i had not been in the room two minutes before i realized that what i had been told about the change in him was nothing more than the truth the man's bearing and his every remark were insufferably bumptious he spoke of his prospects in the july medal competition as if the issue were already settled he scoffed at his rivals i had some little difficulty in bringing the talk round to the matter which i had come to discuss my boy i said at length i have just heard the sad news 
what sad news i have been talking to charlotte oh that said wallace chesney she was telling me perhaps it's all for the best all for the best what do you mean well said wallace one doesn't wish of course to say anything ungallant but after all poor charlotte's handicap is fourteen and wouldn't appear to have much chance of getting any lower i mean there's such a thing as a fellow throwing himself away was i revolted at these callous words for a moment yes then it struck me that though he had uttered them with a light laugh that laugh had had in it more than a touch of bravado i looked at him keenly there was a bored discontented expression in his eyes a line of pain about his mouth my boy i said gravely you are not happy for an instant i think he would have denied the imputation but my visit had coincided with one of those twilight moods in which a man requires above all else sympathy he uttered a weary sigh i'm fed up he admitted it's a funny thing when i was a dun i used to think how perfect it must be to be scratch i used to watch the cracks buzzing around the course and envy them it's all a fraud the only time when you enjoy golf is when an occasional decent shot is enough to make you happy for the day i'm plus two and i'm bored to death i'm too good and what's the result everybody's jealous of me everybody's got it in for me nobody loves me his voice rose in a note of anguish and at the sound his terrier which had been sleeping on the rug crept forward and licked his hand the dog loves you i said gently for i was touched yes but i don't love the dog said wallace chesney now come wallace i said be reasonable my boy it is only your unfortunate manner on the links which has made you perhaps a little unpopular at the moment why not pull yourself up why ruin your whole life with this arrogance all that you need is a little tact a little forbearance charlotte i am sure is just as fond of you as ever but you have wounded her pride why must you be unkind about her tea shots wallace chesney shook his head despondently i can't help it he said it exasperates me to see any one fooling and i have to say so then there is nothing to be done i said sadly all the medal competitions at our club are as you know important events but as you are also aware none of them is looked forward to so keenly or contested so hotly as the one in july at the beginning of the year of which i am speaking raymond gandal had been considered the probable winner of the fixture but as the season progressed and wallace chesney's skill developed to such a remarkable extent most of us were reluctantly inclined to put our money on the latter reluctantly because wallace's unpopularity was now so general that thought of his winning was distasteful to all it grieved me to see how cold his fellow members were towards him he drove off from the first tee without a preliminary hand-clap and though the drive was of admirable quality and nearly carried the green there was not a single cheer i noticed charlotte dix among the spectators the poor girl was looking sad and wan in the draw for partners wallace had had peter willard allotted to him and he muttered to me in a quite audible voice that it was as bad as handicapping him half a dozen strokes to make him play with such a hopeless performer i do not think peter heard but it would not have made much difference to him if he had for i doubt if anything could have had much effect for the worse on his game peter willard always entered for the medal competition because he said that competition play was good for the nerves on this occasion he topped his ball badly and wallace lit his pipe with the exaggeratedly patient air of an irritated man when peter topped his second also wallace was moved to speech for goodness sake he snapped what's the good of playing at all if you insist on lifting your head keep it down man keep it down you don't need to watch to see where the ball is going it isn't likely to go as far as all that make up your mind to count three before you look up thanks said peter meekly there was no pride in peter to be wounded he knew the sort of player he was 
the couples were now moving off with smooth rapidity and the course was dotted with the figures of players and their accompanying spectators a fair proportion of these latter had decided to follow the fortunes of raymond gamble but by far the larger number were sticking to wallace who right from the start showed that gandal or any one else would have to return a very fine card to beat him he was out in forty-one two above bogey and with the assistance of a superb second which landed the ball within a foot of the pin got a three on the tenth where a four is considered good i mention this to show that by the time he arrived at the short lake hole wallace chesney was at the top of his form not even the fact that he had been obliged to let the next couple through owing to peter willard losing his ball had been enough to upset him the course has been rearranged since but at that time the lake hole which is now the second was the eleventh and was generally looked on as the crucial hole in a medal round wallace no doubt realized this but the knowledge did not seem to affect him he lit his pipe with the utmost coolness and having replaced the matchbox in his hip pocket stood smoking nonchalantly as he waited for the couple in front to get off the green they hold out eventually and wallace walked to the tee as he did so he was startled to receive a resounding smack sorry said peter willard apologetically hope i didn't hurt you a wasp and he pointed to the corpse which was lying in a used-up attitude on the ground afraid it would sting you said peter oh thanks said wallace he spoke a little stiffly for peter willard had a large hard flat hand the impact of which had shaken him up considerably also there had been laughter in the crowd he was fuming as he bent to address his ball and his annoyance became acute when just as he reached the top of his swing peter willard suddenly spoke just a second old man said peter wallace spun round outraged what is it i do wish you would wait till i've made my shot just as you like said peter humbly there is no greater crime that a man can commit on the links than to speak to a fellow when he's making his stroke of course of course acquiesced peter crushed wallace turned to his ball once more he was vaguely conscious of a discomfort to which he could not at the moment give a name at first he thought that he was having a spasm of lumbago and this surprised him for he had never in his life been subject to even a suspicion of that malady a moment later he realized that this diagnosis had been wrong good heavens he cried leaping nimbly some two feet into the air i'm on fire yes said peter delighted at his ready grasp of the situation that's what i wanted to mention just now wallace slapped vigorously at the seat of his plus fours it must have been when i killed that wasp said peter beginning to see clearly into the matter you had a matchbox in your pocket wallace was in no mood to stop and discuss first causes he was springing up and down on his pyre beating at the flames do you know what i should do if i were you said peter willard i should jump into the lake one of the cardinal rules of golf is that a player shall accept no advice from any one but his own caddy but the warmth about his lower limbs had now become so generous that wallace was prepared to stretch a point he took three rapid strides and entered the water with a splash the lake though muddy is not deep and presently wallace was to be observed standing up to his waist some few feet from the shore that ought to have put it out said peter willard it was a bit of luck that it happened at this hole he stretched out a hand to the bather catch hold old man and i'll pull you out no said wallace chesney why not never mind said wallace austerely he bent as near to peter as he was able send a caddy up to the clubhouse to fetch my great flannel trousers from my locker he whispered tensely oh ah said peter it was some little time before wallace encircled by a group of male spectators 
was enabled to change his costume, and during the interval he continued to stand waist-deep in the water, to the chagrin of various couples who came to the tea in the course of their round, and complained with not a little bitterness that his presence there added a mental hazard to an already difficult hole eventually however he found himself back ashore his ball before him his mashie in his hand carry on said peter willard as the couple in front left the green all clear now wallace chesney addressed his ball and even as he did so he was suddenly aware that an odd psychological change had taken place in himself he was aware of a strange weakness the charred remains of the plus fours were lying under an adjacent bush and clad in the old grey flannels of his early golfing days wallace felt diffident feeble uncertain of himself it was as though virtue had gone out of him as if some indispensable adjunct to good play had been removed his corrugated trouser leg caught his eye as he waggled and all at once he became acutely alive to the fact that many eyes were watching him the audience seemed to press on him like a blanket he felt as he had been wont to feel in the old days when he had had to drive off the first tee in front of a terrace full of scoffing critics the next moment his ball had bounded weakly over the intervening patch of turf and was in the water hard luck said peter willard ever a generous foe and the words seemed to touch some almost atrophied chord in wallace's breast a sudden love for his species flooded over him dash decent of peter he thought to sympathize peter was a good chap so were the spectators good chaps so was everybody even his caddy peter willard as if resolved to make his sympathy practical also rolled his ball into the lake hard luck said wallace chesney and started as he said it for many weeks had passed since he had commiserated with an opponent he felt a changed man a better sweeter kindlier man it was as if a curse had fallen from him he teed up another ball and swung hard luck said peter hard luck said wallace a moment later hard luck said peter a moment after that wallace chesney stood on the tee watching the spot in the water where his third ball had fallen the crowd was now openly amused and as he listened to their happy laughter it was borne in upon wallace that he too was amused and happy a weird almost effervescent exhilaration filled him he turned and beamed upon the spectators he waved his mashy cheerfully at them this he felt was something like golf this was golf as it should be not the dull mechanical thing which had bored him during all these past weeks of his perfection but a gay rollicking adventure that was the soul of golf the thing that made it the wonderful pursuit it was that speculativeness that not knowing where the dickens your ball was going when you hit it that eternal hoping for the best that never failing chanciness it is better to struggle hopefully than to arrive and at last this great truth had come home to wallace chesney he realized now why pros were all grave silent men who seemed to struggle manfully against some secret sorrow it was because they were too darn good golf had no surprises for them no gallant spirit of adventure i'm going to get a ball over if i stay here all night cried wallace chesney gaily and the crowd echoed his mirth on the face of charlotte dix was the look of a mother whose prodigal son has rolled into the old home once more she caught wallace's eyes and gesticulated to him blithely the cripple says he'll give you a stroke a hole wally she shouted i'm ready for him bellowed wallace hard luck said peter willard under their bush the plus fours charred and dripping lurked unnoticed but wallace chesney saw them they caught his eye as he sliced his eleventh into the marshes on the right it seemed to him that they looked sullen disappointed baffled wallace chesney was himself again End of chapter nineteen